right? When, yeah, once it kicks off. Okay. So maybe we should have it so that it picks like in. Okay. So uh, I was I was asking, or you were telling us about unresponsive pools. Um, what what is that? What are you, what are you considering unresponsive pool? I know we just we just like barely mentioned it. So why don't you start back over Un again? Unresponsive can kind of be a catch-all term. Uh, it's just an unresponsive pool that we've tried things and it's not responding to normal uh, normal treatments. There's something obviously still going on that we haven't identified yet. So I would say unresponsive is a good catch-all term that, hey, there's a problem. We're aware of the problem. Uh, we're still kind of in the diagnostic phase of figuring out what we need to do to resolve it. Because there's really no pool that can't be resolved. It's just a matter of IDing the problem so that you know the correct way to treat it, um, which I think is a better way to go about it rather than just using another MacGuffin term and just calling it, oh, this is chlorine lock, because I don't know what else is going on with it. Um, and it's a term that I've heard thrown around on internet boards. <laughs> yeah, that's, so I was thinking that, that um, you know, there's, there's the chlorine lock, which is kind of like a catch-all when, when you have problems establishing residual. Then there's unresponsive pools that, that, that are like the next step past that, right? Because there's a lot of things you can do to take care of a pool that's not creating a residual, but sometimes when you go through that pecking order of steps of trying to establish it, checking for, you know, whatever, trying to reach breakpoint chlorination, checking for the ammonia, checking for nitrates and all. And then in the end, it's like everything's everything is the way it's supposed to be. What's wrong? Yeah. Right. And that's what the unresponsive pools are. And and I think that there's a there's like it probably could be a grading system with all those. I, I think because so like as well. like um, um, like Rick was just talking about, you know, we had a. Uh, a guy that that not only did the the chlorine bomb, but he did all the other stuff like the typical stuff, right? I mean, and this guy, this guy Bill from Wisconsin. I mean, he's he's not. I mean, he's he's like on top of things, right? He's he's a really great service uh, service a company. Crafty service veteran. Man. He's he's not new. Yes, right, right. And so and so that's the thing, though, is that what what a lot of people may not may not understand or may not comprehend about what we do is that we don't get the calls that are typical right we get the ones where it's like look dude i i've i've, I've done tried everything you know, i've done 100 pools a week for 30 years i have never reached out i got a pool that's unresponsive what do i do now right and those are the calls that we get it's interesting because a lot of times people get it fixed in the head that it's it's something chemical uh, pools are, are interrelated. So, I mean, you could have chemically unresponsive or mechanically unresponsive. Uh, I often tell people, if you've got issues in the pool, if it's, if it's not chemistry, it's filtration. If it's not filtration, it's chemistry. If it's neither, it's probably both. So a lot of times you actually have to look at other aspects of your pool um, to, to get the over overreaching um, solution. Because a lot of it recently... Uh, with so much focus being on the uh, variable speed pumps, there's a lot of people putting those on now who have never put those on before. Uh, they've got set preset points on there where it'll ramp way down at nighttime, and maybe you're not getting the flow that that pool always had before. So someone's saying, I've had this pool for 30 years. I've never had an issue. What what has changed? And then and, that can and, kind of and help with you that, narrow you down say, the, the well, issue. Well, it runs so 24 I, hours I, a day. Go ahead. Yeah, but it's running at five RPMs from midnight to three. <laughs> right, right. So, so that's that's what I mean. Is that you know you'll get calls and say, well, I it's been running twenty four hours a day. My you know I only I only used to do it fifteen or sixteen hours or twelve hours or whatever. It's like well, I mean you realize that you get in some circulation, but the amount the total amount of circulation is way less because you have a variable speed pump. And now they're regulated, right? Doesn't all new pumps have to be variable speed? It's either it's either happened this above year one or horse. it's about to happen. Yeah, okay. Above yeah, above one horse it's got to be variable speed and that that affects uh, they're even making variable speed pumps now for above ground pools. So, uh, gosh, let's 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 inject another degree of difficulty for above ground owners who've never had to deal with this before. It, it um, is about to get yeah. so much harder for pool owners, you know, and I, and I, I don't want to be like the the bearer of bad news or bad tidings or even panic. But, but, but a get ready for it kind of thing is 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's like okay. So if you're having a hard time finding chlorine, you got to find some all some time some type of alternative. And now and now you're having a, a hard time getting all the water in the pool through the filter within within a certain time frame. You know, because it used to be that all this, and I think it still is. That most builders will say, well, even with the variable pump, if we do the hydraulics right, we can get your total body of water through the filtration system in in four to six hours, right? But the problem is that there's so many new um, fiberglass pools, above ground pools, and all that stuff that don't have main drains. And if you only have a the skimmers, the skimmer, skimmer portion working, well, then you're you're literally regurgitating the, the top 18 inches over and over and over and over and over. Unless someone's yeah, you're only servicing the the a couple inches of water instead of the whole body. Yeah, and see that's the thing is that that goes now back to what you were saying earlier is that look, all things considered, if the water is balanced. And you have a chlorine residual and you're still having a problem with cloudy water or algae then then probably what the what the issue is is your hydraulics your filtration or you're not running the pump long enough or you think you are but it's a variable speed that's toned down you know and it's and this the mechanical thing that's unresponsive when really it's it's other questions that you have to ask right that's where you become like the um the, the chemical or the pool sleeves right um and and i'd like I to mean, just you, point you a probably phrase remember that Hold on. Yeah. Just a point of phrase for you. The stuff that you said earlier before I, you know, before I, I interrupted, which I apologize for, <laughs> you are literally the pool Plato today. So I think that uh, a lot of the a lot of the talk are going to be it's going to be from you because that was very insightful. What you were saying. Pool well, Plato. If, not if, Plato. If, That's I mean, we can do Plato. That's fine. Just don't eat it. It's really salty. Um, if you uh, matt you remember and rick you probably had this happen uh to pools you were working on uh what it was about five six seven years ago when variable speed was was just kind of dipping its toe and people were getting into it um it was about the same time where uh a number of of manufacturers started making uv units um so you've got variable speed going out on pools and you've also got uv units um if water travels too slow through a uv unit it can actually break down the chlorine that's in the water too so if you've got a variable speed that ramps down at nighttime and the UV unit doesn't have a, uh, a flow sensor that says, hey, it's moving too slow, let's shut off, you could actually be burning out all the chlorine that you had established in the water at nighttime. So you go and test your water the next morning, you got no chlorine, and you're like, what the heck, I had three parts per million last night, and it's all gone. It's ultimately a mechanical issue, not a chemical issue. So everything's really closely interrelated, so you can't have your blinders on and just think i just do chemistry because you can't just do chemistry if you want to be able to successfully tech pools you've got to kind of think all right there's nine different systems working here together hopefully um what point along the line has failed um because i mean water clarity issues could be a skimmer line that's plugged up by a kid's goggles got stuck in the suction line so it's not pulling the dirtiest water from the surface and it's only pulling the 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 cleaner water from the bottom and i'm saying cleaner because we all know some of the gross stuff we've seen on the bottom um it's it all plays off of each other that wasn't that wasn't uh, an intentional pun matt but uh <laughs> but here we are yeah sorry and you want to keep your, your bottom clean. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't, you definitely need some, some Ezyme Pro, that's for sure. Is this where I'm supposed to interject? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Please save us, Stacey. <laughs> All right. She's All like, right. that's so anyway. not going on a t-shirt or a hat. Keep, no. your bottom clean. keep your bottom clean. Right. Yeah. So, um, so let's talk a little, little bit about chlorine, about chlorine lock, right? Technically, there, you know, the, the chlorine lock is is like we said earlier, it's kind of it could be construed as a catch-all, right? But what it comes down to is that there's there's a few things that cause what is perceived as a chlorine lock. One of them can be a very high cyanuric acid, right? And and, and over the course of the last, I don't know, I, I keep saying five years, but then I realize, shoot, I've been in here since. 1993 so it's probably 10 15 years you know ever since the explosion of using dichlor as a shot from from mass merchants um and then and then also the uh influx of tablets you know imported tablets which as we all know you know the typically the domestic ones are held together with compression 
The other ones are are not, you know, they're they're glued together so they don't last as long. And because you're using more tablets to keep a residual, you're also expending more cyanuric acid into the pools. So between all that, you know, you have people that have cyanuric acid now of anywhere from 100, 150, 200, 300. I actually had someone from the Midwest call me last year. They had a cyanuric acid. The best they could tell is that it was over 400 parts per million. So the problem is, and I think, you know, we were kind of touching on this earlier, is that you really don't get a benefit from cyanuric acid after 55 parts per million. And it ends up becoming a point of diminishing returns the further past that you get. So if you have someone that is at, say, like a 400, you know, or let's just say, for instance, a 300, you have guys like Robert Lowry, who's, who's a very, very smart water chemistry for pools uh, industry veteran. And he says that if you have three, 300 parts per million, that any, any cyanuric acid that you have, your part per million of chlorine should be 7.5% of that in order to overcome the cyanuric acid. So whether, you've, whether you fall in line with that, if you believe that or not or whatever, but just for instance, let's take his opinion or, or his, his um, what is it, uh, you know, his, his thought process. If you're at a 300 part per million and you need to have seven and a half percent in order to have effective chlorine, that means that you need to carry a 22 and a half part per million of chlorine that equals a three part per million chlorine in a pool with a 40 cyanuric acid. Now, does that make sense? 22 and a half percent or 22 and a half part per million? The higher part per million of cyanuric acid you have, you've got a counter with a higher amount of chlorine present in the water to maintain the same killing power as a pool with less cyanuric acid. So, right. And so what that, what happens with that? Well, it's cyclical or it's it's a symbiotic, right? Well, I got to add, you add more tabs. Use, you're adding more you add more tabs. Yeah. You add oh, more cyanuric more, acid. Yeah. You add more tabs. You add more cyanuric acid. Next thing you know, dude, you just need to drain the water out. Yeah. So so that's the the big the big issue is that you have cyanuric acid, right? And so if you have if you have a hundred, that means you need to carry technically a seven and a half part per million. But who does that? Because everyone thinks, well, seven and a half parts per million, that's way too high. I, I shouldn't be swimming in that. And well, yeah, you probably avoid, shouldn't be. Void warranties on equipment, liners, right. surfaces, everything like right. that when you when you get that high. And if you get a 10 or 12 parts per million, then you have issues with with itchy with uh, like scraggly hair, itchy skin, uh, bleached liners, bleached clothes. Uh, you have like pool noodles that start to deteriorate, all that stuff. And that's right. only cyanuric acid, right? That's why someone that has a three part per million chlorine that still gets algae says, well, what the hell? What's going on here? I got well, good chlorine. Do you? Yeah, I got good chlorine. So, well, that's, you know, when I very first started in the industry, the, the manager of the store that I worked at said, said that the, the idea is effective chlorine. So how much effective chlorine do you have? If you're at three parts per million with a with a uh, cyanuric acid of 100, effectively you have zero effective chlorine. Now kick in the, the the pH issues too. If you have a high cyanuric acid with a pH of 7.8 or higher, well, I mean you might as well not even put chlorine in the water. And and it's also throwing off your balance as well. Um, when you're testing your alkalinity, if your cyanuric's that high and you're not countering for that, you could really be thrown off your balance and causing other water quality issues. Yeah, and I think that, that Rick and your Rick's Remedies for Alkalinity, you talked about carbonic alkalinity, right? Yeah, in the last issue, we talked about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so a lot of people call it adjusted alkalinity, especially with software, the software that they have for their water testing systems, but it's actually carbonic alkalinity. So that's the stuff that actually protects the pH. Everything else doesn't. Everything else causes issues. So carbonic alkalinity is the one that we, that we need to... Um, to uh to think about now okay so so in other words what we're talking about is chlorine loss so when we go into the rsl that's that's the different things we need to talk about is what what um what does cyanuric acid play into this but then depending on on where the people are at we have to talk about well what about ammonia what about nitrates right because those those are the other two big things and then we didn't even talk about combined chlorine no, because so that's yeah. another that's another common misconception. Well, I've added four gallons of liquid shock, but my free chlorine still didn't go up. It's because you're you didn't add enough to break down the combined that's in there. Uh, you probably actually made a little bit more combined because um, you didn't didn't knock it out with one massive blast. And the one thing that that you know that I'm think I'm guilty of 
um, that we all may have been guilty of, even the even the listeners now or the watchers, is that when you talk about combined chlorine, we know what the formula is. You know, the formula is 10 times whatever the combined chlorine reading is, is how much chlorine you have to put in in order to break down that combined chlorine, right? So, so that's fine, but we're not talking about contaminant load, right? And, and, that's, and it's the same style of idea with Revive. When people use Revive and they think, well, I'm going to use Revive as a phosphate remover, what they're not considering is all the, all the metals, the organics, and the carbonates that are also in the water. They just want it for phosphates, or they just want it for carbonates. But it's it's it doesn't do that. It's a catch. It's an indiscriminate right? cleaner. It, it right. pulls all that stuff. It, it, right. You can't like hit a dial and laser focus on one specific thing you want to pull out. So if you think about revive being an indiscriminate cleaner, you have to think about chlorine being an indiscriminate killer, right? So when you put when you put chlorine in the water, it doesn't just go after the combined chlorine. It goes after all the other stuff that it can oxidize. You know, whether it be like algae spores, dead skin. Um, you know, um, ammonias, you know, all that stuff it plays into the contaminant load. That and way more, right? There's even stuff that it tries to um, tries to oxidize that it can't. You know, we were we were looking at some stuff uh, with some other people from API the other day, looking at um, some claims from some of the oxidizers in the market, and they were saying, "Oh, well, this breaks down uh, pet dander and uh, suntan lotion," and and I'm thinking, "How does it do that?" How does, I mean, chlorine and shock products don't break down suntan lotion. What they do is they oxidize them and make them break apart to the point where they want to, like. Where you can uh, filter them or they off gas. Well, they well, filter off gas, but also, you know, the, the, the thing about suntan lotion is the reason why you need an enzyme for that is because chlorine doesn't oxidize it. What it does is it breaks it down or breaks it apart and makes it want to adhere to whatever it can adhere to, whether that be toys, tile lines, skimmer, you know, inside your pipes, you know, whatever. So, and one interesting part about the uh, sunscreen, uh, it, with it being that sticky and wanting to adhere to different things, uh, one of the main ingredients in most uh, sunscreens is titanium dioxide. That's also the base of most paints. So, if you think about painting surfaces and things like that it's really good for adhesion it hangs on and that's exactly what you're dealing with on your tile line now so the the longer you let it go the harder it is to clean up um and and really got to think about that inside your filter uh, especially if you've got de or cartridge because that just builds up and and keeps building up and then it's a, a heck of a lot more of a headache to clean off than it is to to maintain it um letting it get out of hand you know that sounds like a major component to pool pudding Mm. <laughs> mm. Mm. Rick's favorite butterscotch. <laughs> I think it's all butterscotch, isn't it? That's chocolate, chocolate pudding. Ugh. Okay. <laughs>